Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Nexus Gaming Series Division E matchup between Backbone Gaming and Pigeon Stitches. And joining me in a matchup that has been long in coming because we've been swimming in the same circles for a pretty long time is Denkstrom. How's it going, man? Oh, are you muted? Check your muting. Uh, am I muted? You are. Okay, restart. How okay. you doing, man? <laughs> doing good. I thought the red light meant on. Oh well. So no, thanks for having me on tonight. It's been a been a while since we casted together. Yeah, or played together for that matter. Yeah, it's been a hot minute as uh, the schedules get thicker. Uh, so does playing together gets a little too tougher to do. However, here we are, ready for a great matchup between two teams. Uh, both kind of sitting near the top of Div E, and we are not going to waste any time because we have Tomb of the Spider Queen ready. Both teams in lobby. Let's see if we get the R button, and then we will uh, get the show on the road. So anybody who doesn't know any better, Dangstrom, Tomb of the Spider Queen, what are we thinking? Uh, Asmodan, I have uh, my opinion, especially uh, down in something like Division E. I think the mass amount of wave clear and just stacking potential play for the late game is pretty good you have pretty strong rotations uh you want some vision control and turn into those uh turn in points around tomb of the spider queen as well uh so i expect wave clear to be prioritized and having some decent front line that can i uh, can tank well and tank some damage yep definitely so anytime you can put together a super strong uh four man rotation on here and really crush the other team in rotations it gives you a really strong early game to build off of and uh, Tomb can be a snowball -y at times, so something to keep an eye out there out for there. Yeah, I think uh, the bands will be kind of interesting. White Mane's going to be uh, available tonight. I'd be interested. I think she's probably should be banned out uh, tonight just because of the amount of healing and pressure she can put out in that mid to late game area. Uh, but it's interesting how they play around that new support that's coming in. Yeah, uh, White Mane coming out today is definitely going to be a factor. It is going to be a first ban Garrosh for Pigeon Stitches. I can always appreciate first ban Garroshes. Uh, they just punish people out of position. I know my team just got picked uh, picked apart with the Garrosh just, uh, just on Sunday this last week. And there's a White Mane ban. Uh, so how do you like that? Do you think that changes the healer matter? You're going to still see Alex and Deckard picked up quite often? Or, uh, or do you I, think I don't, more I don't are going to be... A White Mane, see, I, I have uh, conflicting um, stories for her. Because in my experience with her in my games that I've had, she seems solid, not underpowered, not overpowered, but in a good spot. But I hear from everybody in the community, everybody I play with, everybody around me, how oppressive she is and how strong she is. So I believe all of those things. I just <laughs> much must be in that niche player group that I really haven't experienced that. And we have the Asmo ban that you were talking about. Yeah, for anybody watching tonight, go look at the NGS um, Discord. They have a highlight channel. Go look. Let's just look up Space Bacon. He has some disgusting um, yes. situations. He will really heal people through with White Man. He's just a good support so player in general. And so we have Deckard first picked. And if I am correct, that's Pigeon such as I picked that up, right? Yeah, that is correct. And and kind of going further into your question earlier. So I think she'll be from what I hear at the top of the meta and most teams it sounds like in competitive environments just not going to let her play she's not going to be in the yeah so that leaves deckard can i think is probably the top support um with a couple of exceptions for alex straza like shrines and volskaya where it's really accentuates how good she is but generally speaking it's going to be deckard kane and backbone gaming picking up a massive front line blaze and diablo so I actually think the Deckard Kane is really interesting. I was curious how much these teams had scouted each other because uh, Backbone basically has picked Tomb with Spider Queen their first three games and have a 100% win rate on it. But they also uh, pick up Deckard almost every game. They picked it five times out of their six games and Pigeon Stitches lets them come to this map, but they steal the Deckard, which tells me they might just have a game plan. Maybe they've watched something or uh, scouted out Backbone a little bit just to sort this out. I mean, you see you have strong wave clear. You've picked out Backbone's number one support that they're strong on. Uh, you know, I, I, Johanna and Phoenix are, I think, a great pairing on the map. Yeah, and, and uh, Deckard is not a bad first pick overall anyway right now in Heroes, but if you know it's uh, your opposition's preferred uh, support, it makes that first pick even more valuable uh, we do have backbone banning out the solo lane sonia from pigeon stitches let's see who they'll take away i imagine a support of some kind 
and it's going to be a Stukov ban. Have the uh, the mouth furian, but they don't want the don't want the silence follow up to any sort of blazer Diablo shenanigans. It looks like. Yeah, I mean Stukov is kind of bounced up and then down. He seems to have settled in a good spot right now as kind of a middle tier solid but not spectacular support. However, the, a well timed, well placed lurking arm can just be back breaking in the middle of a team fight. Yeah, I mean, Johanna can live through a lot of things, but uh, when she is silent, she loses a lot of tools uh, to be able to keep her up and do anything in team fights. And so it's, I, I know as a tank player, that's pretty annoying myself. Yeah, I've seen I, Varian picked up. Okay, is this, uh, question is, is it Windblades or is it Colossal Smash? I was going to toss the same thing to you. We have a triple... <laughs> I beat you to it. <laughs> we have a triple front line. I would guess we're going to get one of the two Assassin Heroics um, from Varian. And then we have a Medivh Malfeel. That's really interesting. Um, Last Rites is kind of pseudo-countered by Bunker, although you can play around with it. But with so many melee, is this Tormented Souls Malfeel? Question mark? Yeah, I, mean, I could see a play for Tormented Souls, but then you get the same counter again, go straight into Bunker. Uh, the Malfurion, you know, is going to be somewhat decent to that Malfeel. And if you do not get the Medivh shield on Malfeel, I think Colossus Smash Varian does a lot of damage to him as well and just uh, can shred him. So, who you like in those drafts? The triple tank is interesting. You don't see that a whole lot. Uh, Gul'dan and Malfurion should feel very safe sitting back there uh, doing their thing. So I am actually liking the uh, the Pigeon Stitches draft here. I think it's a little more well-rounded. Mouthail's a good pick, and a lot of those heavy frontliners going to get a lot of value out of that good offlaner into Blaze. Uh, the Medivh, I think that's just a reaction pick to the Varian, and if that is indeed Colossus Smash, I think it's going to work out great. They have, uh, I think, really good wave clear and uh, ways to deal with uh, Backbone's composition. They yeah. just can reset up fight, essentially. I mean, you have Deckard and Medivh that are great at it. 100%. And the, the Malfeel, assuming Blaze goes into the bottom lane, I don't know why he wouldn't, uh, Malfeel will win that lane in each kill. Um, you have a Johanna Phoenix as in your four-man. They're going to clear that pretty fast. Um, so I think the early game here is going to favor the side of Pigeon Stitches. And anytime you're playing a really heavy melee composition... Falling behind early can actually be really detrimental on level because you can't engage from a safe distance and putting yourself in danger when you're down on level. Um, those hit points don't last nearly as long. The damage doesn't seem nearly as uh, strong. So we'll see which way this goes. However, in the red corner, we have Pigeon Stitches, B-Pipe on Johanna, CM Shives on Phoenix, Blacken Avian on the mouthfield, Death Child area on the Deckard Kane, and who is it? Because you don't get the little name over it on Phoenix. It is, nope, Fox on Medivh. There we go. Fox on Medivh. We have Cornmail on Diablo. Tiny over on Malfurion. Simulanist, as I think is what that is, on the Varian. Illa Death on Gul'dan, and Byron Tone on the Blaze. So it is a High King's Quest out of Varian at 1 that really telegraphs you're likely to get some kind of a damage build out of him, whether it's Colossus Smash or uh, Wind Blades. I think Wind, Wind Blades would really struggle into the Johanna Blinds and the Herodric Cube and Scroll of Sealing um, from Deckard King. Yeah, we have a nice engage onto uh, B pipes. I mean, she just pops her uh, her D and just kind of walks out. But uh, you know, I like that aggressive. They need to try to force things to happen over here. I mean, because Medivh's just going to portal them around between uh, mid and top lane all day. And you can already see Johanna and Phoenix. They're tag teaming. Look at how fast they're clearing these waves. Pigeon Stitches is already winning this four man uh, pretty decisively, considering you're basically 80 seconds into the game. Yeah, it's interesting variant. I'm expecting Colossus Smash, but there's a lot of tools to deal with that still. Uh, the variant, you know, it's probably going to go an anti-shield build just for the Phoenix later on, and maybe just try to blow him up as maybe their play. 
So, uh, for the record, anybody who's curious, Pigeon Stitches did have a bye last week. They only played two games, but they dominated both of them. So they're four and zero oh in the early going of season five here. And their opponents tonight, uh, Backbone, had the full three sets, dominated two, got dominated in one. So sitting at a very healthy four and two. Look at, I mean, Pigeon Stitches is so far ahead. They actually took a little bit of a rest break in the bushes there without a lot to do. <laughs> They might want to look at trying to turn in on one of those uh, future rest fakes here. Uh, yeah. You know, basically get Medivh stacked is what they want to do right now. Yeah, Medivh. He's already at 11 stacks, so. Yeah, he, he gets so much more potent once he hits his stacks. Um, and probably Johanna dropping off those 11 wouldn't be a bad idea if they have that much time again. In the meantime, in the bottom lane, as expected, Malthiel winning solidly and the longer these guys go one on one down here the longer this matchup will favor Malfield. yeah it is kind of nice that blaze is doing he's definitely trying to soak it out at his towers and they both are equal in gems right now which is most you can hope for blaze in this situation for sure so, speaking so we of... do have wind blades it turns out on varian here that's really interesting wind blades gives you nice merc control good boss burn um you don't see it a lot in uh, Organized because it's pretty easy to counter as they engage onto the Gul'dan there to condemn and the punish. He walks away as the scroll of ceiling doesn't quite hit. Um, but in Organized play, 5-on-5, five five, teams on comms, you can really punish uh, the Twin Blades there, and he has to get in there um, after 7 to heal himself with his auto attack. When he has to wade through Johanna Blinds and the Haradric Cube, it's going to be tough for him to hold himself in close contact with the members of Pigeon Stitches. Yeah, and the Pigeon Stitches have so many ways of just escaping, whether it's Medivh Shield or Medivh Portals. They got shields, they have slows, they just have teleports all over the place. Uh, you know, even uh, Malthea will just kind of teleport behind him. So it was kind of interesting on how that, that plays out or if they're looking at some uh, some niche role for him to do a bunch of mercs on the side. Yeah, I, what, the, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. Where I was going next was, on the flip side of that, if Backbone is able to get a little bit of a lead, he can really put pressure on the map with the merc control, the boss, the bruisers, the siege camp in the bottom. So it's, that's not to say he can't do anything. It's just not something you see a lot of. Sure, and so with these, uh, they're basically approaching into seven pretty close. How would you like to see? Do you like the normal uh, try to turn in right with, right at seven, or do you try to wait till about nine and get ten off of your turn in? Um, in? I think at higher levels where the teams are a little bit of better at goaltending, Backbone's actually going to get the turn in right here. Um, it, it's... Oh, actually, Gul'dan might be in trouble here. Condemn, punish, scroll of ceiling, hits, an aggressive teleport at a CM Shives. Gul'dan is the first blood of the game. However, unless that portal comes out, like, right now, and there it is. CM Shives had used his teleport, but he gets away safely due to his friend, the Raven. Um, was, that was a very aggressive teleport in, but, I mean, that's what we talked about being able to get away from uh, away from Backbone a little bit is those portals. Yeah, that that's the power of Medivh right there. Um... Down in, in the lower ones, I would say, and even, you know, I'm in Div B, I'm not super high, but I would say get the turn in and, and snowball with it, especially if you have heroes who can siege well, um, like a Phoenix or a Johanna, get some structure damage, get a little bit ahead in level. But Johanna caught out, um, she's going to just kind of walk the other direction because... <laughs> That's kind of fun, even on the uh, bottom lane, with that spider pushing up, uh, Malfield defended the whole lane, and looking like he's about to kill uh, Blaze, even. Yeah, that's that's what we said earlier. The longer that this matchup goes, the more it is going to favor uh, Pigeon Stitches. Now, that wave was defended. Pigeon Stitches, despite losing the first wave, up in XP, Dengstrom. Their superior wave clear and winning the bottom lane, paying big dividends right now. Black Avian looked like he was going to try to turn there. That would not have been a wise idea by himself. Yeah, Simulus is rooted, taking a lot of damage. He doesn't have any protected status yet and will die. You know, I don't think Diablo has any way to uh, to follow up in security extra defense off that. And just unfortunate for Backbone, that Gul'dan pick off right as they get the turn in. They actually don't get a single structure. They don't even get a mid wall or a tower off any of those turn ins. So that wave clear just uh, amazing on Pigeon Stitches and really controlling that, that lane. 
The Black and Avian does get interrupted by the Fire Stomp from Diablo and immediately goes to return in. Blaze throwing down the oil, keeping him away. And now we have a, the closest thing to a 5 on 5 we have so far this game. Yeah, and you see where all the big beefiness comes out of though. As long as they're, uh, they don't take too much poke damage from this Malfeel, they can survive quite a bit with Malfeel on the top. Yeah, actually, Backbone getting the better of this. There's the Jet Propulsion onto Johanna. She does continue to walk the other direction, and teleports probably the same direction she could have walked in that time. Uh, Bud gets away safely. Uh, Stitches, Pigeon Stitches, much closer to 10, though. I think the play here for them is to soak 10 and then force turn in shortly thereafter. Yeah, I'd like to see Backbone try to prioritize those mid mercs. Um, just capture it, hold off, wait to just counter push whatever level 10 and uh, spider turn in that Pigeon Stitches is going to try for. Now, you brought up earlier, it sounded like. Oh, uh, luck are... of bot lane? Oh, that would have been 39 gems. That would have been huge. Here comes the flank, though. Johanna Phoenix Deckard locking in the blaze. He is taking a lot of damage, walking away to safety. Tens are here for Pigeon Stitches, and they move immediately toward the turn in. Only Malfiel needs to get in his 42. But they are going YOLO despite not having 10. I really wonder how this is going to go here for Backbone Gaming. There, story time catches two. Uh, Malfiel is low, though. He's a little hesitant to engage here. So they get out of there not uh, just fine. Deckard uses, there's a lot of uh, three ultimates used on the side of Pigeon Stitches, and they get them low, but they have yet to get any takedowns. You know, there's, I think this is pretty impressive. There's the last rites. Black Avian went and topped off, and then he had the hit points to be a little more aggressive and got a Diablo kill for his trouble. Now both teams have heroics, and we have a lull in the action, so we did see last rites out of Malfiel. Blessed shield for Johanna. Stay a while and listen for Deckard Kane. That is Leyline Seal for Medivh. I blank there. And Purification Salvo <laughs> out of Phoenix. <laughs> Yeah, we have uh, Twilight Dream for uh, Malfury and uh, Horrify, of course, for Gul'dan. Lightning Breath for Diablo Bunker and Varian hasn't picked his level 10 yet. Uh, he's actually going to go for Warbringer. I thought he was going to go for Protected just to help uh, with the uh, with that burst and uh, last rites from the uh, Malthale. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you, but we had a little too much going on for me to really be able to do that. You kind of acted like you assumed it was going to be Shield Wall. If I were Varian, I think I was would not make that decision until Malfiel made his decision. I would have gone Shield Wall into the last rites, and maybe the Warbringer for the increased stickiness otherwise. But he does go for the Warbringer that will help him stay on target. Yeah, I'm going to have to point out this Decker has finished his level 1 quest quite a while ago, and there's a beautiful takedown onto uh, the Phoenix. That's why they dream to finish it off, and if they can uh, kill this uh, Jano or Johanna, they're not going to. They get a beautiful Medivh shield, gets the heals. Uh, but that Phoenix turnaround, they're going to have five. They're going to turn in here in, a, in just a few seconds, and, you know, Backbone's going to have an opportunity to come back, get some structure damage, actually, in this game, and try to get the 13 first. Yeah, it's going to be a, a long road to get to 13 first. Johanna, with her flashlight, is really good at annoyingly uh, interrupting turn in. So B Pipe doing a nice job of goaltending the top. It looks like both teams are now going to move toward the bottom. Phoenix has respawned and is coming back right now. And let's see what Pigeon Stitches does here to zone away the turn in. It looks like, unless Malfield gets on the backside, he does. Blaze almost had it, but not quite. Purification Salvo does a lot of damage to three different targets. Bunker yeah. comes out, and now Mediv is in trouble. He is running for his life. He does escape, and both teams resuming the posture around the tournament. Yeah, I love the bunker where you just hop in there, you just flame them to uh, to death if they stick around. They actually almost drop Fox. Uh, I think his tap is down because he hasn't gone back to do that yet. But Deckard's sustain here is just going to provide lots of value. Uh, worth noting, Medivh has finished uh, his quest. So Gul'dan actually sneaks the turn in on the top while everybody was focused in on the bottom. Pigeon Stitches did have their turn in as well, so both teams were looking for it. However, Backbone Gaming able to secure their second Web Weaver phase of this game. Yeah, a few of these times what I'd like to see Backbone do is hold the Malfurion roots and try to control those portals a little bit more. They're using them. Um, I don't know if she has Horrify up on... Uh, there it goes. Uh, it doesn't do any value for him, but... Box on the Medivh able to secure a Gul'dan who was running for his life. This is really going to 
blunt the offensive capabilities here uh, for Backbone in this uh, Web Weaver phase. Yeah, we probably want to see Blades get moved out of bot lane, get him somewhere else, because Malfield's just going to get that free clear and damage on you. Let's put you in another lane, try to get some more value in a four or five man push. Take that uh, uneven fight somewhere, and uh, it just gets more value than you get on the bot lane. I mean, the issue with the Backbone has with the Malfield, though, is normally you send one of your ranged assassins down there to poke him out. They can't take Gul'dan out of the four man. They actually don't have anybody that they can send down there to trade into Medivh favorably. No, but there's a nice route. I mean, they just they put a lot of damage down, but, you know, Backbone's always getting out there. It's always resetting. So uh, what do you want to see adjusted now that we're on even talent tiers by Backbone to try to even up this game and get a little more value out of those turn-ins? Well, the Gul'dan kill was terrible timing. Both of their turn-ins, they just haven't been able to marshal any kind of offense to get some siege damage out. Uh, both teams posturing again. There goes the Leyline Seal. Only catches Malfurion and... This game is Perma Brawl right now. <laughs> there's a Twilight Dream onto the uh, Phoenix. I think they're trying to go for a blow up kill on him, but there's a beautiful shield and then a. Uh, actually, I thought the Blaze was going to be uh, interrupted by that uh, Stay a while and Listen, but he goes on through and kills him. So that's a one for one with the Blaze and the Diablo blowing up the Phoenix. However, the last rites does take down Diablo. He is on his way back because he had souls, but Blaze being body blocked by Blackened Avian, and that's 39 gems on the floor. Now Pigeon Stitches will retreat as Diablo is here for the re-engage. If they get away, oh, they don't. Deckard, no, if, Deckard, yeah, they, he does get a, away. If they could use a, a route to control those, uh, that Blaze just thought he was going to get out a little too... Uh, he thought he was going to escape all that. Without using Bunker, he tried to use it as they killed him and put it on a 10-second cooldown. But he probably just needs to pop that a little sooner. Everybody hops in, throws out the flamethrowers, and, and try to secure a kill that way. And protect yourself. Yeah, the, the fact that uh, all four members of Pigeon Stitches were able to withdraw safely due to that portal was a really big deal. Because although they did win the team fight, they were pretty bruised up. And with the full strength Diablo coming in for a re-engage, things could have gone south there. So that was a really big disengage for them. Yeah, and not to mention they reset Diablo's souls. He's back down to three souls after that last fight, getting the, getting the kill on him earlier. Uh, they're really in a driver's seat. They have 16. I agree with this boss call right here. Uh, just try to, uh, to burn it. Um, I don't think there's much that can threaten you. I mean, we have some Horrify, we have Blaze, but if I was Backbone, you probably don't contest this. You get a free boss. Yeah, they are moving up here, but I think they realized too late. Varian was showing in the bottom lane. And even if you do have a Horrify, a good Johanna player is going to save that Iron Skin to just stand through that Horrify anyway. So a uh, limited utility when there's a Johanna on the other side. I mean, you talk about fight resets. You have a uh, the Ley Line Seal, Stay a While, Listen. Uh, just so many options just to stop the other team. You just even having the roots out of uh, Scroll of Ceilings out of Deckard. So not just Boss Dengstrom, but Turn. They were sitting on 80 gems, and they get back-to-back turn-ins with the Boss. They have level 16 talent advantage. Varian is still pushing bottom lane. If I am Pigeon Stitches, I let him push to his little heart's desire, and I want this key. And they're actually trying to secure a kill on Diablo. Uh, they actually get it even after Fear and Twilight Dreamer burn. Blaze ate a scroll of ceiling and the stun from the boss. Now Purification Salvo comes out with a bunker. Beautifully timed. Medivh able, to, I'm sorry, Malfurion able to dive in there as well. And despite uh, being low on members and the Diablo kill, so far this is a pretty valiant defense here from Backbone. Yeah, they're going to lose this keep almost certainly just because the spiders here, how much damage that does. They have a Phoenix there, will lose some siege. They got another wave coming in. Um, they're probably going to wait half a second and re-engage off this. I think they have a lot of good options. Yep, and this keep now certainly going down in the bottom lane and the mid lane off camera. Varian is trying to double soak with Malfeel. Uh, that is not a winning proposition. Um, it's not. The especially because he went on a pale horse. I mean, he just can't keep up. Literally, there's not a way for him to keep up. <laughs> And they're gonna try to capture him out. He drops the uh, drops the armor right away, but the Medivh portal is just gonna cut him off. And that's 46 if they drop him here. Yep, down he goes. 
Um, there was, there's not enough room for those gems. One of them actually appeared over the wall next to the fort, and they were able to get 20 of them really easily. <laughs> I, I foresee a Medivh ban coming in game two, Bangstrom, because Pigeon Stitch is showing with the way they're using the portals to engage, to rotate, to disengage, that this is a team that clearly plays with him and knows how to use him. Probably more than any other hero in the game, Mediv relies on not so much himself, his own ability and what he does, but having a team that is able to maximize the plays that you set up for them. While everybody's pushing top, they sent this Varian. Uh, he actually got the got the bottom mercs, and that kind of counter pushed uh, bot a little bit. But he actually was beating up Malthiel in lane in a, just a one on one fight. Had to force Malthiel to double soak rather than try to stay and get any value off that mid spider. So I, you know, I'm thinking Backbone might be trying to adjust. Man, if Blaze isn't working, that's just not a winning matchup. Let's put Varian in there and see if we can't get a kill or at least stop that uh, Malthiel's push and dominance into Blaze. And Blaze is some place where he can drop a bunker and help out the gold dam when they need it. Help out that Diablo that's getting caught out. Yeah, that's one um, one area that Twinblaze Varian is good into, and that's a one-on-one -on -one trade. A big condemn punish, scroll of ceiling, down goes Malthiel fast, story time catches three, Phoenix putting down the damage, aggressive portal comes out, Gul'dan is in trouble, use fear defensively, catches three, and now they are tanking in the tower. Johanna does not care, she is still on Gul'dan. <laughs> he is walking away and does reach safely. However, Fox is going to fall to minions and the fort. And that ends up being a 1-4-1, one one, despite the fantastic engagement uh, onto the Malfurion. And this brawl still going down. Phoenix the next to fall. Pigeon Stitch is in trouble. You uh, just took the words I'm out. Fox tanking that fort and the Johanna they got a little cocky and it gets turned around I love that the Diablo stays in very was top lane he wasn't in here until the last two kills uh, and for backbone right now I think just try to get soak all three lanes get that top lane pushed up a little bit and start taking structures you're gonna hit 21st and there's so much bank structure XP right now for them they're gonna get 20 relatively quickly and probably 21 closely after that yeah, that was a huge play there for the side of Backbone Gaming. They still have 30 seconds before uh, Pigeon Stitches will be at full strength. They're pushing down this mid lane hard. They're going to get keep here, I would guess. Web Weavers are literally just now arriving. You have Bunker up. You have a Twin Blades variant. Uh, Corruption Gold Dan, he's actually looking like he might be... Oh, no, he's just dropping his, uh, his level 20 back there as a quick escape. But I think you might arguably be able to just go for a possible core play. You have Bunker if you need to really get out. Horrify as well. But uh... Instead, it looks like they're going to make a double keep play. And I kind of like that call better. Pigeon Stitches was in full strength 5 on 5. Basically, if you engage there, you're deciding the game because both teams have a win condition available. Yep, but there's three catapults about to get on uh, Backbone's core up on uh, up on the top. There's a Twilight Dream and Lightning Breath going out. Uh, Pigeon Stitches is just walking away to disengage. There's a Flesh Shield coming in and a re-engage by Brighton, actually. Yeah, that Jet Propulsion was huge and fantastic. Five man stay a while and listen, followed by a Purification Salvo. Catches out Varian, the rest of the members able to dive into the bunker for safety. It is a one for one Top lane, though, is taking core damage on Backbone Gaming. 57% while that fight was happening. If your Pigeon Stitch is there, hold them there. Do not let them hurt. Now, Furion is going back. That looks like what they're trying to do, though. They have caught Diablo. Um, if you don't know, by the way, three uh, Catapults will easily outpush Web Weavers. Yeah, I mean, they just dropped that uh, that top one. That's why it's kind of interesting seeing them try to end. Uh, yeah. They're in mid. They get this uh, They get this top pressure, and mid is so easy to de-push. Um, and Malfield's going to be able to keep various lanes pushed themselves. And this is turn-in for Pigeon Stitches. They have enough uh, fairly easily, and that's going to be um, a, a hard time for Backbone Gaming. Their structures are, are low. They have top lane already pushed out. Their structure or their core at a 50% basically. Yeah, they also time it very nicely with uh, a bottom Merc push as well. And so it looks like they want a five man top into the open lane, push that lane up, push with that spider. 
and try to stretch out backbone as much as they can between that uh, bot and top lane. Yeah, I agree. I mean, a, a level 21 objective here is going to be very strong. A kill or two, and they can end the game. Varian is showing in the bottom lane, so that should signal aggression uh, from the side of Pigeon Stitching. Yeah, and if I'm Varian here, I want to be up there at that team fight. We can clear up uh, spiders in the core after this. If you can win a team fight here, let's get up there and get, uh, get a flank. And again, if you get a bunker drop, everybody pile in there and just use those flamethrowers. Try to get as much burn down as you can safely if you need to use it. And here we go. Wow, those red health bars went down fast. And Malfia will be the first to fall. Last Rites does go out just for damage. There's the portal for the disengage. Teleport does get away. And there's the jet propulsion. Just Mitch's Medivh. He goes down anyway. Stay a while and listen to zone. A disastrous team fight there for pigeon stitches and they will be forced to back away however bottom keep has fallen to the web weavers and the siege giants and right now you see backbone looking and starting to move up try to get that top lane pushed out and i, I imagine they're going to do is try to go for a boss play. you have to boss play for yeah. game is what they want they have a twin blades variant he needs to be the one up there uh, not clearing bottom lane yeah, Malfield's, Malfield's down, get Blaze down there to, uh, to off, off clear this. Yep, 100%. I mean, because their boss damage is uh, not great without Varian. I mean, they're doing it, but Varian here would chunk through this thing very quickly. Yeah, and so we have this uh, this middle, and they're actually looking for maybe a backdoor. Maybe they're going to go for try to uh Oh, to they're going to catch Varian. Yep. There's the teleaggressive teleport. There's the scroll of ceiling, and it catches him, and a great... Heads up, macro play uh, for a short-handed pigeon stitches there. Varian almost had the time, uh, the opportunity to charge out to a red minion that was just on the left-hand side there, but I think they slowed him down just enough to prevent that. And so now this uh, this top boss, I imagine, is going to go through keep. I don't know if they get it, but right now pigeon stitches is playing more aggressively than trying to defend that. Yeah, I think they're trying to keep these uh, catapults coming in the bottom lane because they're down here, they're posturing. Malfiel is solo clearing boss. A huge lightning breath. That is the level 20 upgrade, I believe, because that seemed really big, is it? No, no it wasn't. That just, was the regular uh, one. Yeah. yeah, the new Hellfire, I think, is uh, is just longer. It goes for 12 seconds rather than four. Um, it no longer increases the, uh, the length, length and size of it. So... You're not going to see that very much. Losing two men at level 23 minutes into the game and actually turning that into an advantage. So really big hats off. Pigeon Stitches, they played with the Vision really well and caught the Varian out for a big time pick. Now, neither team has turn in. However, Pigeon Stitches have a lot more map pressure due to two keeps being down for the side of Backbone game. Yeah, honestly, if I am a uh, backbone here, I just try to look for look for a fight. Just rotate around his five, clear these lanes like this, and go try to find the other team. Like that's their win condition. The other team can just play around vision, play around the Medivh portals, and you'd need to try to force something into them. Uh, yeah. If you continue to play, if they continue to play keep away, it's just a, a clock ticking down of these uh, these catapults going to kill your core at some point. Yeah. Now I will say, backbone only needs ten more gems. And uh, they will have turn on themselves, so they might be waiting for that. And also, finding that big engagement is very difficult into a Medivh because of that constant vision. Thank you, Cody Kraz, for the raiding party, and welcome everyone to the last minutes of a Division E matchup between the blue team Backbone Gaming and the red team Pigeon Stitches. Yeah, Pigeon Stitch with lots of uh, map control here, just catapult stacking up in that top and bottom lane and them easily being able to de-push the mid lane. That's the only keep that uh, Pigeon has really lost so far. And it's so easy for them to de-push and just let the other lanes uh, push in backbone. You know, maybe there's they safe, uh, safe soak this and try to look for that fight and turn in, but uh, they got to make something happen outside of just soaking. You know, also worth noting, Medivh took uh, the level 20 talent where he insta-clears minions and catapults. So they've been utilizing that all over the map, really helping with their already superior wave clear as well. Yeah, Pigeon Stitch is looking to play aggressive. Varian's out. Blaze isn't here with the uh, with any sort of bunker on for him. 
Alfield the first to fall one more time. Uh, Gul'dan had a huge horrify to interrupt Purification Salvo. However, uh, this time Varian goes down and Malfiel is back. Johanna in trouble. I assume she has taken Indestructible at 20, although I haven't checked if she has. And now a fighting disengage coming out from Pigeon Stitches. Medivh is in trouble. He is unable to port away. Now B-Pipe on Johanna in trouble as well. The Indestructible is procced. Malfiel is here. However, Blank on the flank hits a big jet propulsion. And this could be trouble if Backbone Gaming can clean this up fast enough. They can win. But two lanes of Katas are pushing. And their core already at 50%. They allow Pigeon Stitches to retreat three members strong. Yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, these catapults, especially 27 minute catapults, are going to clear these spiders kind of quick. There's two on top lane, one on bottom lane. <laughs> they didn't uh, learn it's their lesson be last a time. Race situation. I, I'm pretty sure Backbone wins all of this, though. It, I mean, it's going to be close. Last time those catas cleared out the. Okay, now Varian has gone yeah, back. Yeah, Varian's back. Varian's Very back. nice. That's what you need. Now you wait for the web weavers. Only two members are up. And uh, Bunker comes down to tank the core and give out armor. Nice job there by Backbone. Jet Propulsion catches nobody. The core for Pigeon Stitches is going down. And in a very hard fought back and forth game. It is Backbone Gaming handing Pigeon Stitches their first loss of this Season 5. Yeah, great. Taking out the uh, number one team in their first map. This is Backbone's map to play, but I, I gotta say it didn't look as dominant as I expected to them for uh, to pick that as their, as their map choice. You know, I, I really, really think the turning point in that game was about halfway through Pigeon Stitches overstayed in that mid-engagement and tanked that fort, and it gave Backbone momentum and that team wipe. Everything up to that point had been Pigeon Stitches all the way, and that really allowed Backbone game uh, back into the game. Yeah, and really, I mean, uh, there were some really odd, uh, uneven fights that Backbone was able to take, I think, largely on the back of their Diablo play. Uh, it was hyper aggressive. He got caught out at times, but in the fights that they needed, the Diablo came through with the damage, the peels, uh, the alts that they they required. The Hellgate was uh, was really nice on that last bottom fight. It you know I think there was a a team that uh, or a player that influenced that turnaround was the Diablo, especially that mid fight, just helping secure kills. So now uh, that we are going to see these teams adjust to one another, is there any bans that you expect to be see based off of the play from those two teams? Um, I expect Decker to still be highly contested at number one one spot. Um, Medivh, you might see. I mean, he did the most hero damage on Pigeon Stitch's side and caused a lot of... Uh, a lot of issues, I would say, for Backbone in general, just with his uh, mobility and protection status that he was able to provide. So you might see Medivh ban. Uh, I, I could consider a uh, Diablo ban as well, just from how impactful he was the last game. Yeah, that was a, uh, a very entertaining game. It was very back and forth, and uh, there were points throughout it where you could really... Oh, man. Pigeon Stitches has this game in the... Oh, just just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is this is Backbone's game to oh oh wait maybe not um uh but these teams are very close I think um we're gonna see a lot of these types of games this season in NGS um, as a byproduct of the new Swiss scheduling. Yeah, and uh, yeah, those are really exciting games. Then that uh, it matches you up with people with similar records, so hopefully similar power structures throughout the throughout the the map. Or throughout the season, I should say. Uh, it, it's really interesting. The first, first week's kind of random. It should be started out. The second week should be a little bit better. And the third week, I expect a lot of a lot of draws, a lot of really close matches for everybody to start watching. And even in the early going, there actually has been a fair amount of draws. If you flip through the standings, there's a lot of splits. Um, I mean, placement in NGS is, is, is hard. It's the hardest thing about this league, I imagine. Those guys do a really great job of putting these teams in, in competitive divisions and it's been you know outside of a few outliers which you which are always going to have a really great season so far 
Yeah, well, I mean, they uh, they bracket those MMRs so tightly. It's that's that's why I think it's so competitive. You have what anywhere between like ten and sixteen teams in the division when it first opened up, and they're all within a two hundred MMR bracket, which is you know decently close as far if you want to go from the top to the very bottom team in a division. I mean, uh, so yeah, I think, and plus you're getting matched up with teams with similar records for you. So you're just getting matched up with more people similar to your MMR. Um, yeah, I think it's just a recipe for competitiveness. You know, with with so many teams this season too, the the gap between the bottom of D and the top of B is only 500 points. That's three divisions, mm-hmm. only 500 points apart. So uh, there's going to be a lot of competitive games. All right, looks like both teams are ready. All right. So map two, Tomb of... I'm sorry, Tomb of the Spider Queen was back map one. Ignore everything I just said. Map two, Sky Temple. <laughs> and Sky Temple is a little bit of a different animal than Tomb of the Spider Queen. Yeah, I expect a lot more prioritization on boss control, a lot more prioritization on global abilities, uh, murking potential out of, uh, out of this map. It's one of those maps that you don't necessarily even have to go in on the core yourself if you want to play that conservative just snowball elite control temples control boss control map pressure you can do that uh so it'll be really interesting on how much global they try to prioritize in this i do expect something like a uh, the hawk to be played up if mouth is strong for pigeon stitches they have that on that pale host that's a pseudo global i i could see them picking that up as well yeah for sure and i it, i don't know why when you said on a pale horse, I thought of uh, your old similar talent, and then it dawned on me. Did we have the game one draft go with no bans and no selection of your old? I think that happened. I think that it indeed happened. And there you go. Pigeon Stitch is already respecting the Diablo game, the Diablo play from game one and banning that out first. So I think they realized that that was a, a portion of their downfall last game. Diablo in the hands of a right player, like, for example, you instead of me. <laughs> is really difficult to deal with. And there's the Mediv respect ban going the other way. So the two we were kind of expecting as the standout players, uh, heroes from last match, are banned. This is one of the fun things about casting uh, the same team playing multiple times is watching that internal draft kind of develop between the two teams. And as a result of that, White Main apparently falls out of the ban priority and is taken by the side of Backbone Gaming in lieu of Decker King. Yeah, and this is an opportunity as well if Malfeel is not picked up by uh, Pigeon Stitches here. Pick up your all on the side of Backbone, ban out Malfeel, um, and you still have another strong solo laner, and that armor, or any of the, either of the ults that URL gets and the armor she provides, can just accentuate that white main healing through put in a skirmish fight. Reduce the damage that's coming in, increase the healing that's going out, and I think that's a that's a good recipe for a winning combination. And once again, prioritizing that front line, they do take the global presence of Dahaka paired with Garrosh. And Deckard Kane and Muradin were coming out uh, for the side of Pigeon Stitches. Yeah, Garrosh is a favorite of uh of Backbone. They've played that's their most played tank so far. Uh played it uh, three times already last last phase, uh, with fairly good success. Uh, it'll be interesting how the uh, that pairs up with the with the Deckard slows and the Deckard roots. I'm just trying to close that gap, though. Yeah, well, you keep doing it to me. You know, at the end of NGS last season, Garrosh was first pick, first ban in every game. He's fallen out of, not out of the meta, but out of that high prioritization within the meta. I think partially due to Deckard Kane and all the big AoE slows and roots he has. It's hard to uh, grab somebody when you're walking through all that sludge. Um, you know, same thing kind of Jaina is now very prominent, even though we didn't slow the perma slows on the Garrosh. So he's still really solid, but he's not quite prioritized in the same way because there's so many heroes that make it difficult for him to walk in and get that big body slam. In. Yeah, now that we have two bands on each side, a little different than last season of NGS with just one band on each side to start that off too, the yeah. map. Usually it's a, it's a meta band on each side, and that second game especially usually maybe more of a targeted band on something that might have frustrated you the first game. So I'm surprised they pick up a Blaze, actually, and not a Malthael to play into this garage. Now, what I'm surprised is not that we're seeing Kael'thuzad, Bankstrom, but if you're bringing in a Kael'thuzad, why not last pick it? I don't think that it would have been selected. So the fact that it was picked, giving Backbone Gaming the opportunity to draft around that, that surprises me. 
Um, are they ha do they have something even more super secret in mind outside of that Kel'Thuzad? <laughs> I don't know. I'm waiting to see here. I can see Valera? a argument for a Zildjian here, actually, as, a, as an option um, into this Garrosh. I mean, Zildjian just kills Garrosh. Garrosh can't walk within a range of Zildjian after level 16. And this is a map that's generally going to go to at least that at least that level. Um, I think your Blaze and Murden and Kel'Thuzad have lots of good uh, boss control, actually, and you can get away with an auto attacker. It is Zeratul. Now, Zeratul is a great hero into Falstad. If Falstad gets caught out in lane by a good Zeratul player, he can just crush Falstad. He's really squishy. Uh, double global is for the side of Backbone. Let's see if they're able to leverage that. So I'm really what I'm really curious about is this that if this is a combustion blaze game, uh, if you get uh, VP from Zeratul to set up some sort of wombo with Kel'Thuzad, uh, combustion is the complementary other part of the burst you might need to have to secure some kills against this uh, against this white main or onto a uh, false set or Li Ming. Or is it going to be the Zeratul that wants to harass the back line and go might to the Nerezim, I think it's called, where he just gets to double cast yep. his abilities? Um, I could see either or. If we are going to see Combustion out of Blaze, I actually did cast one of those games. Uh, and one of the weaknesses of Combustion is that it can be interrupted. So if you're going to go Combustion as Blaze, I think it really behooves you. I forget the name of the talent. Blaze's globe talent at one that gives him unstoppable on his D because then you can proc the unstoppable while you're charging your combustion and the opposition can't interrupt it and interrupt your heroic and that feels bad when your heroic gets in. Yeah, for Blaze it causes it to go off prematurely, gets less slow, less of that ramping damage uh, coming up, but if they, if they get a VP off of that, it won't even have an option to interrupt it really. But it'll be interesting on how, how that counterplay is. You don't get false set in the VP, he just gusts everybody away, and then you get no combustion. So it'll be fun to see how they that interplay at level 10. So Pigeon Stitch is trying to get up off the mat and pull out the split here. B Pipe on Muradin, Fox on Zeratul, CM Shives on Kel'Thuzad, Black and Avian on Blaze, and Deaf Child Area on Decker King. Yep, and we have Cormiel over on Garrosh Simulanist over on Li Ming. Brian Tone. Oh, Bri Brown Tone, maybe? Over on the Dehaka. Uh, Illadeth over on White Main and Tiny in the False Dead. I think that might be Brown Tone. I could be wrong. It is Brown Tone. It's a, uh, Brown a tone. triple <laughs> stack there by CM Shives. There's the toss in the Murd, and that's really not the guy you're going to be targeting with that. He dwarf tosses to safety. So whenever there's a Kel'Thuzad on the other team, the big, big area that we're going to watch, he stacks for Kel'Thuzad, and he is at six stacks 50 seconds into the game. That's a pretty good start. Yeah, honestly, just throw one person whatever lane Kel'Thuzad is. Don't give him anybody else to stack off of and try to chain any sort of uh, chains into. Just rotate to some other lanes. I, I Denying Kel'Thuzad stacks early, because you know he's going to get some around the objective time periods. Um, is going to be really more beneficial for your team than just trying to uh, trying to skirmish against them like this. One of the uh, heroes that I think is really going to struggle is going to be Falstad with so much burst damage on such a squishy hero. All of the Kel'Thuzad burst damage if a Zeratul gets on him. So let's keep an eye on those Falstad deaths. He really has to be uh, careful about how he positions himself and keep an eye out for that Zeratul, who's actually solo laning currently two on one, White Mane and Leeming versus Zeratul. Muradin is grabbing the vision, is making his way to Force Fox. Yeah, just talking about our new hero here, we have White Mane, and she's actually going to go W build Clemency at level 1, which is going to allow her to not only target enemies, but now target her allies as well to give a direct out-of-combat heal to them. So it doesn't look like we're going to see a full uh, Q build, which is generally considered one of the easier builds for, but probably more, uh, maybe more rewarding, but harder to pull off W build for. Now, unlike last game, this game, it is actually Backbone Gaming that's really crushing uh, this, this solo lane. Black and Avian about half health, low on mana. It looks like he's losing out on those globes. And a great tongue to keep Avian away from that regeneration globe. That is an often underappreciated part of the solo lane matchup, is bullying your opponent off of the regen globe. Yep, Black and Avian probably just needs to hang back a little farther and soak it closer to his tower. So he doesn't need to necessarily uh, take those trades when we have two siege camps pushing in on him. Great patience. And Kelsey, 
by Garrosh there. Garrosh could have gone in on that Kel'Thuzad, but kind of waited. There was no damage there. And you see that Kel'Thuzad, he got stuck for a little bit against just the Garrosh while everybody's out doing camps in that mid lane, but he's rotating up to where uh, more of Backbone's at, trying to get those stacks. He's at 9. I imagine he probably gets to 15 during this uh, during this objective phase just by uh, kind of getting around the other team and making sure he stacks well. It would help if he had somebody up there with him. You don't want him stepping into a Garrosh Leaming by himself, though. No, but he's already up to 13 stacks, just throwing chains out over there. We have Deckard and uh, and Blaze on the camp. Uh, the Hawkers looks like he's just going to split Soak out. They might just trade these. So yep. Kel'Thuzad may not get 15 if he doesn't go to where uh, Backbone's at. Now, this is the global being taken advantage of by Backbone here. I want to see Pigeon Stitches. If it's clear the other team is trading, you need to get into these lanes a little bit more and get some soap because they're going to fall behind. Uh, there you go. Zeratul is, is up in the top lane. He's kind of hovering around and catching that experience. Uh, Dehaka, though, not leaving the bottom lane. He is getting as much structure damage and XP as he can down there. And if they can get uh, this Blaze up here in time, they might be able to contest these last few shots and uh, finally get Kelty's out a little more stacked here, maybe even get a pick up. Now they do catch Li Ming. She is in trouble, and down she goes. You were pretty close. He's at 14 stacks. I uh, had an opportunity to get two or three more there, but just missed the chain. Yep, he's going to go Skullcrack or Murden as well. Just help some more of that disruption. Um, I can see those little mini suns just messing with Garrosh a little bit more. Sure, sure. And of course, uh, we have full Q build cleave and uh, rending cleave and wormhole over on the Zera tool. Everything else is looking fairly standard. We do have Ruby picked up on uh, on Deckard. It's maybe just a just a favorite there for uh, Death Child. We're in a lull period in this game right now. Pigeon Stitch, the official spray of Pigeon Stitches, by the way. They're going out in the mid lane. <laughs> An actual pigeon stitches. Yeah, actual so, pigeon stitches. Definitely not stitches with his tongue sticking out. It's it's a pigeon. So. It is definitely a pigeon. <laughs> Thanks, so we talked Remus. about that. Uh, yeah. So we talked about that uh, separate side soak. Um, right now, you do have pigeon stitches going to return the favor. Of Blaze pushing up bot lane, and both teams are almost dead even. Yeah, XP is very close despite the double global. Uh, that Backbone has. They haven't really been able to take advantage of that uh, yet. The longer the game goes on, though, the more opportunities they will have to do that. Yeah, they're going to be pretty even, but uh, right now Pigeon Stitches is trying to a little out-soaking, and I like the uh, the prioritization. They clear top first. They can probably start to get some more priority on that bottom camp that's just now coming up, and maybe push in and do some structure damage on bottom. Now this is going to be a problem here for Pigeon Stitches. Their Bruiser camp has already been taken. Uh, Backbone Gaming is taking uh, their side a uh, Bruiser camp. You could leave Dahaka and or Falstad in the top lane to push with this uh, and really force a response from Pigeon Stitches, a team that doesn't have an easy way to rotate up there and contest that objective. It'll be interesting to see how these two teams play this. Yeah, keep the Hawk up there with that hard camp. Um, you can probably even give a little bit of value on bot just to try to work on getting that top fork with that uh, that hard camp up there. Secure le level 10, then take an uneven fight with your talent to your advantage, your ultimates. So Zeratul is staying in the top to clear up, clear up that lane as best he can. A mis-engagement onto the Falstad. The jet propulsion just missed. But that means Dahaka at any time, like maybe right now when his teams have heroics, can come down and give Backbone Gaming a 5v4 with Zeratul in the top lane. We have Avatar for Muradin, and here we go. These two teams diving in won't even have time to go over heroics. Dahaka has come down. It's the 5-on-4 that Backbone wanted. There goes the bunker, and Kel'Thuzad thrown backwards into a 5-man taunt. However, nobody has fallen. How has nobody fallen? From the side of Pigeon Stitches. Kelty's on escape with 100 life is absolutely amazing. Uh, Zeratul still hasn't picked his ultimate. I think Blaze had to snap pick. Actually, V-Pipe might be going down now. He's trying to escape his Muradin. Uh, I think Blaze had to snap pick the, uh, the bunker there just to survive. That was a five. So is that centuple stun into a full Lee Ming combo 
and nobody died. I don't think I've ever seen that happen before. <laughs> uh, very interesting, very unique, uh, especially with a leaving false set on your side. I, I know that false that W build is strong. Maybe it takes a little while to come on. Maybe the next time they pull that off, they get that kill as he starts ramping up and scaling with his talents. And maybe so, but now we will finally have time to go over these heroics. Bunker drop, as we saw, by Blaze, Avatar from Muradin, Shadow Fisher from Kael'thuzad, Zeratul being very cheeky, not showing his yet. Stay a while, and it is going to be Void Prison. Stay a while and listen from Decker Kane. Hey, Kael'thuzad's a little bit slow. He's only at 22 uh, stacks right now. He's really needing that, uh, that extra spell power boost. Um with getting it all the way up to 30. I mean, that's 75% spell power. We're talking about almost doubling your damage. Oh, I think that was a misclick there. Instead of a jet propulsion, we had a bunker drop, and now Kael'thuzad is in trouble. Stay a while and listen, unable to keep him alive. Uh, part of the issue that I think Kael'thuzad is having in the stacks is the last big team fight, he spent the whole time running the other direction <laughs> instead of trying to put out damage. Uh, so that'll definitely put a... Uh, Put a slowing onto your stacking. Uh, Zeratul is kind of bullying this uh, Garrosh on top lane. He actually brought him all the way down to 200 life or 200 health, and is really just pushing this top lane almost solo up here. So I think you get Fox in those team fights, and these might start uh, swapping around the other way to Pigeon Stitch's uh, side. I think Fox is one of their most skilled players. Well, there was the power of White Man there with two heroes wailing on him. Dahaka was actually gaining health uh, due to the White Man healing. Yeah, you got White Man healing, you got Tissue Regeneration from Dahaka. Uh, they put a little pressure on him, but I definitely don't think they're going to get any kills until they uh, get this Kelty Zod stacked. He needs that 75% spell power just to follow up on these VPs. Um, now we have, there's a double jet propulsion, Warp Toss in aggressively. However, Fox VPs hits Ooh. nobody and goes down anyway. August into the Void Prison. Kael'thas is in trouble, or Kael'thasad is in trouble. Dives back in and out of the bunker. Pigeon Stitches is in trouble now. A defensive stay a while and listen. Almost saves his team, but Kael'thasad does fall. In the meantime, Global's now starting to show as this entire time. Blue Siege Giants pushing in the bottom lane. The Haka, after the team fight, immediately burrows into the bottom. And you're going to see a level discrepancy build in favor of Backbone Gaming very quickly. Yeah, they got a nice wave. They get a soak at top. They get a wave. They get a soak in mid. They're going to be well on their way to, uh, to 15, I think, by the time this bottom temple is done. All the forts are going to be dead. And we'll uh, we'll see. I don't. They might get a little bit of keep wall damage, but not a ton. So that was a big moment. It looked like uh, Pigeon Stitches was a little discombobulated, not quite on the same page in that team fight. However, they are invading, trying to bully out Dahaka and steal some of these last remaining shots. Toss goes into Blaze, hits a double jet propulsion into Kael'thuzad damage. Nobody falling quite yet. Pigeon Stitches being very aggressive. However, their health bar is much lower than the side of Backbone Gaming. Fox in trouble again is able to blink out the other side, but now he is caught by Dahaka. He will go down, question mark? There he goes. Yeah, you know, I think that might be... And Boy P just comes off. That was actually a 4v5, if I counted all that correctly, on the, on the side of Backbone. They come out ahead. That was really similar to those in-fights of that Tomb game, where they took 4v5s and were coming out ahead. So, I mean, they get a they get a free boss right here. They still have Gust for control of this. Uh, they still have Garrosh to help throw people off if they somehow get through a Gust, you know. This is uh, get boss, get those siege camps, and let's take Bot Keep. Now, as weird as it sounds, this is actually the time where we're going to see if Pigeon Stitches has something, because Kael'thuzad is officially a full-strength hero now. So it's going to be this next team fight that's going to go a long way to show us if it was worth the 12 minutes that it took to get here for the side of Pigeon Stitches. Li Ming's actually backing it. I don't know if to read that as confidence that they're going to let uh, these three play into the five and this fully stacked Kael'thuzad now, um, or what, but she's not here. False Head's just now coming in, and... Uh... We'll see how the defense goes. Kel'Thuzad thrown, and he goes down fast. Mighty Gust does split away Muradin. 
Uh, Bunker is there to save him, but Pigeon Stitches, they are in trouble. There goes the VP used defensively. Falstad is flying away. Li Ming is in the mid lane this entire time for reasons that escape me. You oh, we get a lot of... A lot of pressure put on Brown Town here too. I mean, they have to use a garage disengage. They actually don't even score a keep out of that. So if if I have to say anything, it's a uh, good job on Pigeon Stitches. They don't lose a keep out of that boss siege camp push into them. That they can only be counting their blessings now. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna have a leaming, her value is in her reset. She can't get her reset side soaking the mid lane. If you're gonna take a fight, you want the leaming to be there with you. Falstad is in trouble. He flew directly into the waiting arms of Zeratul. Zeratul waits for the shield to expire and then polishes off Falstad. So I didn't actually see this. Was that Zeratul? Did he actually, um, what's that What's that called when he can teleport to the last person? The Vorpal Blade. I think he Vorpal, might Did he Vorpal Blade all the way top? top I off think he fight. might have, yeah. We're going to watch that, Twitch chat to see if they catch it in two minutes. <laughs> that that would have been really cool if that happened. I couldn't, I wasn't quite watching him in his flight, um, but that would have been pretty impressive if they pull it off. Now a five on four for Pigeon Stitches, and they go hard. I love to see that. Everybody going down. Fox in trouble again, though, is able to walk away, but not able to secure any kills is Pigeon Stitches, and Backbone Gaming looks very healthy despite fighting five on four. Yeah, this white main healing is just insane. She, they're trying to go after you. See, BP beep, beep pipe trying to wail on white main, and she just can't die. However, Kel'Thuzad finally gets value, hits some big AOE damage, and able to secure kills on Garrosh and Dahaka. And now is the moment for Pigeon Stitches to see if they can resume control of this battlefield. Siege camps are laying into this bottom keep. Zeratul has been sent to deal with that, while the remaining members of Pigeon Stitches are securing this top temple. Five kills to four, 17 to 17, three keeps up each. This is about as close of a game as you're gonna get. Yeah, I was actually really kind of surprised how much structure damage that uh, Pigeon Stitch was able to do passively. That Zeratul basically pushing that top lane against the Garrosh earlier gets a whole pretty objective almost just by taking that wall and uh, and that keep. Kalthazad might that, be in trouble. Speed coming up from the Dahaka. He hits the tongue. Yeah, down goes Kalthazad. He stayed about five seconds too long there. And uh, the Dahaka using the Brush Stalker able to get in and get some dinner. Yeah, pretty ballsy of Zeratul just going for a little bit of poke uh, there too. Uh, we're molding back out luckily and not uh, not being more kills. There's not going to be a lot of objectives. They're going to kind of play around the soak, playing around 20. We don't have boss up for another minute and 15. So right now it's both teams just trying to feel each other out. And if there's any ults on the side of uh, Pigeon Stitches, I'd almost want to see them try to get their own engage that they want. VP, uh, the front line, get Celtics on the back line, maybe delete this white main before anything even starts. Falstad flying in aggressively again with no vision. Um, but it is Pigeon Stitches that's able to secure the Siege Camp. Now, Dahaka is in the top. Kel'Thuzad is just now spawning. Um, and now Dahaka starting to leverage the Global Fox going in onto the Leaning. Uh, does miss the W and treating back in the other direction. I do like that uh, prioritization of harassing that Leaming. She didn't take Spell Armor at level 1. She took Power Hungry instead, so she's honestly quite vulnerable to a Kel'Thuzad or Zeratul. Uh, pressure in the back. Oh, the bribe from Falstad, however, Pigeon Stitch is having none of it, and there's the stay a while into all the Kel'Thuzad damage. The Gust isn't able to push anybody away, and Garrosh goes down. Dahaka being very aggressive, however, he is split out from his team. There goes the bunker. There is the scroll of stealing. Cleanse coming out. Dahaka will go down. Two more kills for Pigeon Stitches, and they come roaring back. Yeah, just burn boss right now. Uh, take it take it out. They don't have Gus isn't up. They have both their tanks down. So this is a, a nice free boss for them. Yeah, despite not having spectacular boss burn, Blaze is actually going to the top lane to take care of that pressure there. Pigeon Stitches also has double Siege Giants in the bottom lane. So there's going to be a lot of pressure coming bottom uh, that Backbone Gaming is going to have to deal with. Double Siege and a boss, and that will allow Pigeon Stitches to probably take this temple uh, for free. 
yeah, really free, and they're uh, doesn't even look like they're going to side soak any uh, any other lanes. They're just going to five man sit on this temple and try to go for two keeps out of this. I think if you're backbone, I think you can kill this boss before you lose your bot keep, but you're most certainly losing uh, losing mid keep. Yeah, definitely. Looks like Zeratul. I'd kind of like him to see D, D push top a little, um, as long as they're showing uh, in lane, they being backbone gaming. But they want to make sure that they have all hands on deck if Backbone does decide to contest this mid-temple. Oh, you got two globals. I mean, Backbone's going to hit level 20 uh, just barely before uh, Pigeon, but they're going to, so... Or maybe not. I guess that, that keep value is not what I was uh, calculating in there. Now, once again, they're taking a 5-on-4, and again, the stay a while and listen into all of that Kel'Thuzad damage. Dahaka had an aggressive flanking burrow. He was actually able to get his tongue onto the Kel'Thuzad, but was much too far from his teammates to get any follow-up. A huge Stormbolt onto Li Ming. Zeratul was just close enough to get in there and finish him off. Backbone Gaming, they're in trouble. Yeah, I, right now you gotta hope for Gus. Did uh, did Falstad take the uh, Gus upgrade at uh, level 20? He did not, he got an epic mount. So I, I think if you had a Gus upgrade, you might have an opportunity to push him to bottom keep, but now it's really hard for you. So shield already down, 84%, and uh, barring a miraculous defense here, because there's still 20 seconds before any more reinforcements are coming from the side of uh, Backbone Gaming here, 50%, 55 however, Pigeon Stitches is going down fast. Zeratul and Blaze do fall. Muradin taking a lot of damage. Still 30%. Still looking good for Pigeon Stitches, but that was a little bit closer than I thought it would be. Yeah, and uh, let's say you're Falstead. You go the uh, Wind Tunnel level 20 upgrade. You don't lose that, lose that core right there, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, Pigeon Stitch is kind of very close, losing both of their basic uh, siege damage characters on that core and having to finish it off with a Muradin and Kel'Thuzad. Maybe not the most comfortable finish, but they get the win. They do, and it ends up being a one-to-one -one split from two teams that were really close. In I mean, this was as good, as competitive as a matchup as you'll see. This is why we play NGSs for, for sets like this. Both these teams deserve to win. A split after seeing these teams is about what I would expect. Both games were really close and really back and forth. Yeah, it was really, really fun to see, especially that uh, that second game. It was uh, kind of the, almost the opposite of the first one, Pigeon Stitches. Uh, be on the back foot through that uh, that mid game portion before coming back in with a good fight, similar to that backbones uh, resurgent in the Tomb of the Spider Queen game. We're gonna see if we can get uh, Blackened Alien in here for a uh, little interview here. Sure thing. That was a really fun Hello. set, man. Those were entertaining games. Hello, <laughs> welcome, and congratulations on pulling out the. The split there, that, those were uh, those were pretty great games back and forth. What was your kind of thoughts after playing that set versus those guys? Uh, you know, it was a really fun set to play against them. Uh, uh, we were really worried about that second game, especially when we uh, started it up. I was definitely worried. I I wasn't on my I wasn't on my comfort pick. They took away the Dahaka, but uh, we we pulled through in the end. We we got together and uh, got that victory. So you guys, I think, are now five and one on the season. Is that correct? Yeah, we're five and one. We got the first set of buys. Why, why do you sound so disappointed, man? Most teams are going to be stoked about five and one. <laughs> we were hoping to go like undefeated through the rest of this phase as well. <laughs> and uh, it was that it was the last couple of team fights in on uh, Tomb that really got got us. Yeah, we were commenting that that Tomb game in particular was such a seesaw. We're like, oh, it looks like Backbone hat. No, no, they don't. Pigeon Stitches, they've, oh, no, never mind. It, it was really, I mean, both games were like that. Actually, it was a really um, fun set to watch. So are you guys uh, one of the many new NGS teams we have in here? Uh, actually, yes. I don't think anyone on my team is uh, has been done has done NGS before. So are you guys completely new to kind of organized amateur competitive? Are you chair league refugees like many of us? How'd you, how'd you come to be? Tell us the story of Pigeon Stitches. Well, uh, so 
I decided a couple of weeks ago, right, like, you know, right at the end of season four, because I had a friend who was, uh, who was playing, and it's like, I decided that I wanted to get myself into it. So I joined the league, and I was looking for a team to, for season five, not to, not to captain, just to be a part of, because I wanted to, uh, be a part of this. But it just turned out that there was, there was no one, that, like, I couldn't get a team, uh, my tryouts didn't go well, I guess. So by the end of it, I put together a team last minute. And since then, we've just been practicing and playing as, you know, just a group of friends uh, coordinating. Well, Dengstrom and I will both tell you, Dengstrom, what's the best way to be on a team in Nexus Gaming Series is to start your own team. <laughs> and find as trolly of a name as you can, too. That's my <laughs> advice. So. Oh, yeah. No, the name, a lot of people have given me a couple, a couple problems with the name, but uh, I just, me and a couple of friends found the Paper Stitches Spray, and this is the first thing we thought of. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a perfect name. I wasn't. Don't worry. <laughs> well, uh, congratulations on a great set, five and one. Probably a top of Div E, I would still guess. Any uh, closing thoughts, shout outs, hi mom, anything like that on your way out the door? Uh, no, no, I think I'm good. I hope you guys have a great one. All right, man. Well, have a good night. Good luck the rest of this round. Uh, also, thanks to Backbone Gaming. If you're interested in finding out more about them, they are on Twitter and Facebook under Backbone Gaming. So go check them out. Dengstrom, any closing thoughts, shout outs on your way out the door? Uh, no, you know, it was a fun series to watch. It's fun to see the different ways and different divisions all the way from E up to Storm on how all that that uh, that played out i'll have to uh to pick black avian's mind another time off uh off stream uh but it was really fun thanks for inviting me out mongoose tonight uh thanks for uh whoever rated you as well i missed the name earlier but i'm sure that i've got a lot of viewers to this division this fun division e match uh top of division e at that and uh you know it's been a while since i've casted and i've enjoyed it so thanks for the opportunity well, happy to pull you out of the retirement home and back into the hot seat there. We've been trying to set this up for a little while. Just hadn't quite, hadn't been able to quite get it. So happy to do so. And if this set doesn't show you that any of these divisions can be entertaining to watch and very competitive, I don't know what will. Um, you know, almost in a way, there's, there's a part of me that enjoys casting the lower divisions uh, in a way more there's a little more creativity there's a little less Always of a creativity. slave to the meta you really <laughs> never know what's going to happen um and in that way you know the div you know div e div d div c sometimes even div b you just it's uh it's crazy so it's a lot of fun this this set was a lot of fun um i will be back tomorrow at oh i don't know what time but it'll pop up on the thanks for watching screen i believe it's seven o'clock so uh, feel free to jump in there. And in the meantime, we're going to throw you over to another member of our NGS family. Game currently going on Div C, Sidestep. Oh, no, that's me tomorrow. Hey, here it is. Okay, 8.30, me here tomorrow, Sidestep versus Dunning-Kruger Knights, Division C. And now we will throw you over to... Nope, he hasn't started yet. So we'll throw you over to Murda. Stepdads versus Reborn Knights Red. That should be a really good game. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks again, Dengstrom, for hanging out. And hope you all have a fantastic night.